Okay. So what I want to start off with is kind of where we've been and what we've been doing. And uh, so first off, we did, you know, what is philosophy? And we, you know, did some work on quantification so that we could get to the how of thinking. Um, and then we did... The sources of philosophizing, so that we kind of get to the the uh, the why of philosophizing, right? We looked at the ancient Greeks to kind of get an idea of what it means to question the world, and then we looked at the ancient Chinese to get a variation on questioning the world, which was really more of a kind of question of questioning, questioning our relationship to the world. Okay, and now with Bell Hooks, the first week, and then this was last quarter's. Had Heraclitus, Xenophanes, and now we're at Bell Hooks. Now, Bell Hooks is a contemporary person who's still alive. Uh, unfortunately, this always happens. I, she doesn't actually capitalize her name, and I try not to do that, but Microsoft really gets pissy about it uh, at Google. All right, so with her, we're doing theories of liberatory praxis. So this is where I want us to come back to this notion of Peoria as contemplation and contemplation as being with the pattern, considering, considering the templates that make sense of the world. And the way to do that is uh, from experience, from your own experience. So let's take a look at this theories of liberatory praxis text, just kind of. This is actually really important. Uh, from the perspective, in my opinion, of us as people inside of a system that we understand in a way that most people we've lived can't understand it, right? What we've lived, that we've read, <laughs> can't understand it, right? That is, Karl Jaspers is a German thinker died in 1969, lived through World War I, World War II, different world, right? Heraclitus and Xenophanes, they're way back. <laughs> so they're way back. There's totally other cultures, totally other civilizations. Why do we even bother looking at these people? Well, because they talk in general about the human condition, but because they talk in general about the human condition, they still have to talk about it specifically from their milieu, from their circumstances. So what we have to do is examine our own circumstances, see the circumstances that are around us, the things that we see that have made us who we are and question those things and then see what is it then that these people that we're looking at could add to our understanding of ourselves, right? So let's popcorn this uh, first paragraph and look at actually something that she discovers as a young person that actually has been discovered by almost every thinker in the history of humanity. Okay. So I'm not trying to demean, I'm not trying to take away from what she did. Uh, this is an awesome thing when you're a young person, you suddenly realize that contemplation and theory and speculation and uh, imagining other ways can actually make your life better and actually help you, right? 
So uh, Kennedy, would you read the first sentence for us? Sure. I came to theory because it was hurting. The pain within me was so intense that I could not go on living. I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp what was happening around and within me. Great. And most importantly, I wanted to make the hurt go away. I saw in theory then a location for healing. All right. So theorizing is something she starts doing because she doesn't understand why she's in so much pain, why she's suffering so much, right? Uh, and to me, this is an interesting thing from the point of view of, yes, it's, you know, when, when, when a black person or a, a, a poor person or a, a gay person or a, a feminine presenting person talks about the fact that they've suffered a lot in our society, uh, they're really not trying to win the victim Olympics. They're not trying to compete for who suffered the most. What they're, what they're doing is, is they're just trying to tell you, this is what I've been experiencing and it hurts. And I bet that you experience hurt, right? So she comes to theory because she's hurting. The pain within me was so intense, right? That I could not go on living. What, do you, what does that mean? Can you take a first stab at the significance of that sentence? Uh, I cannot go on living, mm -hmm. Uh, just not having, I guess, the energy anymore to continue, like, yeah. computing. Doing the stuff that you're yeah. right, okay. Like, like, functioning and yeah. also have your mind focused on something, so. Yeah. This is a really beautifully simple way of saying to you, if I hadn't begun to theorize, I would have killed myself. Literally. Because I hurt someone. Right? I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend. And what is, what is comprehend, right? There, there's a difference between understanding and comprehending, right? When you understand something, it's something that you, you literally, uh, you have it. And it's, it's something you can make use of. Comprehension and comprehending is more about uh it's it's more about reaching out and around to just sort of get a read of what's going on in a circumstance or around a situation right i cannot fully understand each of you but if we begin to right because i can't just know you so well like i know two plus two is four that i can get you to do whatever i want besides being manipulative that's just not necessarily something possible but i can't comprehend you right i can embrace you right we get this notion that hending prehensile or hend is that it literally is a hand so when you talk about to comprehend you're talking actually about how you can in a sense get yourself around an idea or around a person or around a situation right i came to theory desperate now look at that word desperate what does desperate mean Ari, do you know what desperate means mm -hmm. when you do something like badly and somehow it's private something when you're desperate you want you want something really badly right mm -hmm. usually it's almost like you've exhausted all of their evidence. Right. That's a good way to put it, exhausted. Uh, and, and, and you're, you know, because it also gets us a little back to what Kennedy had said earlier about she just couldn't do it anymore. She was exhausted, no energy, no spoons left, right? Um, desperate literally means uh, despirited, right? So it actually has to do with, with the fact that you, you've lost your spirit, you've lost your, your will. Right. I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp what was happening around and within me. 
Most importantly, I wanted to make the hurt go away. I saw in theory being a location for healing. Uh, <clears throat> and now we get something in the next kind of pages, next pages, next paragraph here of this Terry Eagleton quote, we get something that's reminiscent of Jaspers, right? The very, one of the very first things Jaspers talks about, the what children. Is, what is that one line? Please go back up right there where it says, um, I saw in theory, you know, location for healing. Ah, good. Well, the idea here, of course, is she, she feels, she, she felt like she was at the point she could die. She's desperate to comprehend what's going on around her. And what theory does is it allows her to be whole. So a part of what happens when we feel really, I would, I would suggest that a part of what happens when we feel really um, hurt and uh, victimized or, uh, you know, that we're suffering because of something that somebody did to us or because we were born into a bad situation uh, is that we're wounded and, and constantly being harmed. So you have to figure out how to heal yourself. You have to figure out how to, and it really does become a sort of physician heal thyself kind of thing, right? It's uh, the only person who can ultimately heal you uh, outside of a God probably is yourself. Uh, other people can help. So what she says here then is, is that she saw in contemplation, she saw in theorizing, she saw in, in profound consideration a place where healing happens, like a, like a, a place where you could go and, and wash your wounds and relax and give yourself time to become whole again. Uh, something that I would, uh, something that I would, would really want us to, to, to keep in mind is how uh, the word, and I might have said this to y'all before, health, whole, and holy all derive from the same root. So that a lot of times, you know, when we talk about, you know, don't touch uh, you know, don't touch the Pope, his person is holy, or don't touch that statue, it's, it's holy, right? It's the idea is that you will contaminate it or you will, right? In other words, you'll take something away from it. You'll make it less whole, right? So what she's doing here is she's saying that with the encounter of theorizing, and she didn't know this is what it was called when she's a kid, just like kids would, you know, kids don't know their philosophizing. Kids don't know their theorizing. They're just playing beautifully, but playing, right? Uh, but this is, this is the kind of, you know, where it comes from. So Terry Eagleton is actually a famous uh, critical theorist uh, who does a lot of stuff with uh, uh, literature theory. Children make the best theorists since they have not yet been educated into accepting our routine social practices as natural. This is really the sort of thing I've been talking to y'all about off and on all semester is the way that the stuff we do, the, stuff, the way we're born into a world that's already going, it's in the middle of everything, right? Uh, and we don't have as great of an impact on changing that as it, it would be awesome to have. We get to the point by the time we're at least graduated from high school where we think, well, you know, this is just the way things are. It's, it's just the natural state of the world, right? So in this, she and Eagleton are in agreement with the Ospers that children who haven't been educated into the system yet right, haven't learned to think that the things they see are natural, right? That's the reason why when I was, stop me if I've told you all the stories, I don't want to like, you know, go to it, but that's the reason why when I was in first grade, it's like seven, I was in first grade, 
and a black family walked into a restaurant in Italy, Texas in 1971. Have I told you this story? And the old woman who ran it, who I thought was one of the sweetest people, walked up to them and said, I don't care if you eat here, but you have to eat in the kitchen with the help. You can't eat out in the front. And my teacher, because Waxahachie had just integrated, so my teacher was a black woman and was actually, 1971, the first black person that I'd ever interacted with on a regular basis. But I was a kid, so how did I know that that was not normal? I thought that it was normal that we had a black teacher. I thought it was normal that there were black kids in my classroom and Mexican kids in my classroom. I didn't know that it had all been desegregated the year before I came to school and that the high school and junior high still weren't desegregated. It'd be two more years before they were desegregated. So for me, when I saw that happen, it made me really upset because I didn't know what the hell was going on because I hadn't been socialized yet. My dad made me shut up and be quiet because he'd been socialized and didn't see anything wrong with it. God rest his soul, right? So children make the best theorists since they've not been educated into accepting our routine social practices as natural and so insist on posing to those practices the most embarrassingly general and fundamental questions. Why can't they eat with us? What's so different about them? And asking it loudly enough that other people were turning and looking at in my mom and dad. And they're like, basically making the faces of get your kid under control and teach them the way that things are naturally organized. White people and black people don't interact with each other or they don't eat with each other. So, um, you know, I posed that question. I posed another question. I finally was told to be quiet. And then what ended up happening is we didn't go back to that restaurant for two years because I'd always throw a fit when I wanted to go back. But we finally ended up going back because by the time I was in fourth grade, I'd been educated and socialized enough and I just didn't care anymore if I, right? <clears throat> and so insist on posing those practices the most embarrassingly general and fundamental questions regarding them with the wondering estrangement which we adults have long forgotten. Like I also asked the embarrassing question of why do black people live on the, that side of town? And why do Mexicans live over here? And why are most of the people who work in fields Mexicans? And why do the Mexican children uh, leave school? This, again, it's the 70s. Why do they leave school for a few weeks and then come back where they've been? What are they doing, right? And it's because they, they've been taken out by their parents to go help do agricultural work. Uh, you know, or even when I was 12 years old and I'd already been socialized enough and I asked my uncle Adrian, who was a Pentecostalist pastor, Innocently enough, why do you think Hindus and Buddhists are going to go to hell? They seem like they're really nice people. And everybody was standing around that family gathering looked at me like I had three eyes and six arms and I was some sort of beast of the apocalypse by having the idea, why would a God of love want to send to hell people who do good things? Right? And they're just like, that's just the way it works. You go to hell if you don't believe in Jesus. And that's also what changed my path. To probably more that very conversation in Mahia, Texas with Uncle Adrian and my cousins and my dad. My dad, again, was doing the pickup work, trying to make sure that I shut up. Uh, is probably what led me to become a philosopher in a lot of ways, right? Since they do not yet grasp our social practices as inevitable, they do not see why we might not do things differently. Right? And so this is something you have, so I'm talking about my experiences, but this is something you probably remember 
remember from when you were a kid, some moment where you made adults uncomfortable because you're asking questions, not just irritated. Obviously, kids ask questions to the point that they finally irritate somebody. But I mean that you were talking to people, asking questions, and they finally began to think that you're getting a little bit too close to saying heretical things. Right. Like when Jaspers talks about the little girl, it's like, you know, uh, she's like, uh, where did the world come from? Or where did I come from? Uh, me and mommy, where did, uh, where did, uh, oh, where did y'all come from? And, da, 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 da. and then, oh, where did all that come from? Well, it's a part of nature. And where did nature come from? Oh, it's part of the universe. And where did the universe come from? Oh, it's God. And then they ask inevitably, where does God come from? And then they're told, that's not a question we ask. It's not something we think about. God is always. And what the hell that means to a kid who hasn't always been always is always, to me, is always itself an interesting issue. But y'all have had the experiences. Anybody remember one where you asked a question that made your parents so flustered that they were like, you need to shut up and quit asking these kind of questions? Ah, okay, yeah. Two kids do. <laughs> And it's crazy because you talk about you know the way you're raised and you know by uh and you're taught you know right rules of socialism and all that other stuff. right so with my son <clears throat> who has ADHD starts asking questions and really I mean has the mind to where uh, really challenging questions yeah and I try to give him answers yeah my answers almost sound ridiculous like <laughs> stupid they don't make sense right. <laughs> Because a lot of this stuff is, if you really look at it, it's almost stupid. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And so I'm trying to explain to him what I've been taught. And he's asking me questions. Well, why did you do that? Why did they think that? And I'm just yeah. like, wow, these are really great questions. Yeah. I don't necessarily have really good answers to it. So, yeah, it's um, it's sometimes really challenging. I can understand, like, how your father possibly felt, you know, in that restaurant yeah. when you were a child. I can actually say, you know, with my nephews, uh, taking them out to do stuff when they're kids, me, you know, I'm not, I'm not some paragon of anarchy. I, I <laughs> they'd start saying stuff and I'd be like, y'all really don't need to be talking about that right now. Cause they're, they're, they're also, uh, uh, they're also biracial. So there's also another fear there. Like, I, I really don't want y'all to, y'all need to be a little more careful about what kinds of questions you ask. But you should ask questions, but maybe not here <laughs> at this place where we're at. Which, you know, I can under, looking back on it, I can understand my dad because it was the 70s and it was rural Texas. It was just out of the 60s. There were still lots of people whose houses would get visited by people if you said the wrong thing or you promoted the wrong thing, you know. Uh, so Bell Hooks is a young black woman and she's going through all this stuff and she's a very brilliant, smart person. And really, you know, even her siblings are all really smart too. I think they all have some kind of degree and they've all been pretty successful, but she's the most famous and she got into a lot of stuff with her dad, right? So this is what she kind of talks about here. Or Khan, could you read starting with whenever? Uh, whenever I tried in childhood to compel folks around me to do things differently, to look at the world differently, using theory as intervention, as a way to challenge the status quo, I was punished. I remember trying to explain at a very young age to mama why I thought it was highly inappropriate for daddy, this man who hardly spoke to me, to have the right to discipline me, to punish me physically and with whippings. Uh, her response was to suggest I was losing my mind and I need, uh, and in need of more frequent punishment. Yeah, so this is a, a common issue, uh, especially back, you know, when she and I were kids, uh, that fathers, and this wasn't an issue actually with my dad. My dad was, Although he worked a lot, he was very present in my life. But, uh, you know, a lot of fathers would just not interact with their kids much. 
you know, they were working when they weren't working, they were with their friends when they weren't with their friends or doing something, you know, for the church or something like that. So they didn't really end up doing as much with their kids as they, as, as you would think they did, right? But at the same time, they're the ones in control of the house, the home, right? The father is the head of the household. And uh, usually punishment was divvied up that way. Father punishes, mother does whatever, right? Again, these are not things that have to be set in stone. It's not this way in every family and it's not this way in every culture, right? Uh, so she basically already sees that there's something really weird about a person who's really strong and has a lot of authority, uh, but never, ever interacts with me. Why is he the one who gets to whip me and punish me and put me in the corner? Right. <clears throat> Are you want to read this paragraph? We're not going to read every paragraph. I just kind of want to get it. <laughs> get it into the text. Imagine if you will this young black couple struggling first and foremost to realize the patriarchal norm that is the woman staying home taking taking care. Sorry, it's okay. T taking care of the household and children while the man work. Even though such an arrangement meant that economically they would always be living with less, trying to imagine what it would, what it must have been like for them, each of them working hard all day, struggling to make, maintain a family of seven ch children and have to cope with one bright-eyed child, relentlessly questioning, dark, daring to challenge male authority rebelling against the very patriarchal norm they were trying so hard to institutionalize. institutionalize. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so look at, so she is attempting empathy, right? She understands that this situation was shitty, but it's not exactly like they themselves had not been socialized into it, right? And part of the socialization process sometimes is you're just so damn busy, you, you don't have the energy to want to question or challenge anything, right? Uh, yeah. Going back to my some of my experiences, you know, you're talking about the man of the house and that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, the job that I had for 20 years, I would go and on deployment for like three months at a time. Mm. And I would come back home. Right. And I'm supposed to uh, think, I think myself that I'm back, you know, and my, my children are supposed to listen to what I have to say. Yeah. And I'm being challenged by my children as to why should, why should I listen to you? Because you're you never here. here. You know, yeah. mom tells us what to do. You know, and uh, that was really challenging because, yeah, uh, you know, I had to reestablish myself. And as soon as you get to that point, mm -hmm. I'd be gone again. You'd be gone again. And then the issue, and yeah, and the issue there is, too, um, that you've, you know, in one sense, you've been the the mother and the father who want their children to have the best life they can uh, and want their kids to grow up to be good people uh, are confined by sociological roles and expectations, right? They don't have to be, but it's very difficult to see that you don't have to be, right? So, you know, in one sense, you're, you know, you're in a situation where you go away on a regular basis because you're deployed uh she's in a situation of you're deployed so she has to you know take care of both sides uh the kids are just kids and they're growing up inside of a situation where this looks kind of natural but it seems more natural the person who's there would be the person who would be the authority figure which then makes you feel like a guest in your own house which is actually one of the reasons why a lot of people who come back from deployment with ptsd have so many issues is that they don't actually feel at home in their home so that's another thing. This is all actually a part of that big word there, patri patriarchy, right? The idea of the patriarchal, the heteronormative, you know, all of these expectations that go around it. 
this isn't to say that, you know, there haven't always been civilizations in which, you know, the men were dominant and the women were, were partners, but not quite as dominant where the father was the, you know, head of the house, that, that stuff's there. When we talk about patriarchy, what we're doing is we're sent, we're talking about the centering of the role of the father and it's of the man in it. And it's, it's, being centered and privileged in that way in such a way that everything derives its power right from that in a weird way because of the patriarchal structure you get deployed or someone gets deployed or has to travel a lot for the work and what ends up happening is the mother becomes the vice father because they're doing both roles, right, for a while. And um, that has a lot to do with this notion that the man has these certain kinds of duties to society to fulfill. The woman has these certain duties to society to fulfill. They don't fulfill them, they're not doing a good job. The issue there, of course, is, is that it, it puts so much pressure on everybody, including the kids, to learn how to conform to this. And you're so busy adapting and conforming to it, you don't actually have a chance to question it, right? Uh, there are very good reasons why there's a chain of command in the military, right? That doesn't have to actually transfer over onto a family. And this is, a, this is another part of the issues here that we're dealing with where really what she's doing here is she's doing a wonderful job of getting us to see that all human beings live in intersections. They don't, they're not just one thing, but they live at the intersection of a lot of different processes, right? Yeah, we could read this and we could say, this is the experience of a black person. We could also read this and we could say, this is the experience of a woman. We could also read this and say, this is the experience of a Southern. We could also read this and say, this is the experience of an academic reflecting on their life, right? And that each of those has its own roles, its own powers, its own structures, right? So that's really all intersectionality is. That every human life <clears throat> every human life right, is not just, it's not just one role, okay, but it's also not just connecting the dots between two roles, but it's actually a constellation that intersects in really weird ways sometimes that we don't expect. And this is actually the reason that it's not a bad idea. I, I put forward in my dissertation. It's not a bad idea that we actually think about reality more as a web or fabric, right? Where every little role or every little structure, structural role that we that we may be playing is a spot that entangles another part of the fabric. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. So I could do me or I could do one of y'all or I could do bell hooks, right? But we could go, and when we talk about intersections in this kind of way, right? We could go, let's just use Jim since he's been kind enough to give us so much of his own experience. Father, soldier, son, husband, white, man where else to go from there but there's so many right all of these things are happening and they all have competing expectations right so we think uh husband father son man does they, does those are just all variations of the same thing but actually they're all different roles and they all have different expectations of what you're supposed to do probably the person who thought this out more than almost anybody not quite like this, and it's weird to say, is Confucius. 
because Confucius was always trying to get people to recognize where are you and what is your relationship to your parents, your siblings, your children, the emperor, heaven, right? Because every one of these relationships, if you think about it, what does it mean to be a husband? that you're married to somebody? <laughs> what does it mean to be a father that you have kids? What does it mean to be a son that you have parents? What does it mean to be a soldier that you're inside of a military company? What does it mean to uh, be a, you know, now here's where it gets interesting. What does it mean to be white? And what does it mean to be a man? And what are those relations? So those relations are where it really gets weird because this stuff, this stuff you'd find almost in any society. And I know it seems weird to say, but you won't necessarily find man in every society because what we mean by that is not actually what everybody means by that. And why literally makes no sense outside of our culture. Right? So these are relationships, but they're the interesting aspect of these relationships. <clears throat> is that they're structurally imposed for some reason. There we go. They're structurally imposed for some reason, right? Let me get this in the video. Come on. All of this stuff is structurally imposed when we're talking about man and white. This actually lets me get to one of my more favorite things to talk about. <clears throat> because now that I've actually got us talking about intersectionality. I'm about to get there, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch this over here. This thing. Okay, so getting to this place of talking about the intersections. Intersectionality is basically uh, how multiple aspects of ourselves cross and recross each other. And as I was saying, they usually they're all about the different kinds of relationships that we actually are fulfilling, right? So I could also put up, you know, I could put up here if this were me, I could put up, you know, a uh, professor or teacher. And, you know, we could also put in here student. I've been a student and I've been a teacher, you know, all of those kind of things. So it's uh, how these multiple aspects of ourselves cross and recross each other and play in and in this crossing they pick up um they pick up the threads of heavy structural order and what i mean by that is what i was talking about a second ago 
you know, when, when I ask what is white, what is man, right? What is heterosexual? What is, you know, all of these different kinds of, uh, these different issues. And so what you can do here is you can kind of go through and you can see uh, in heteronormative patriarchy or in uh, a structural system that privileges the male uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the heterosexual, then what, what does that kind of look like? Well, all right, so we've already said it privileges the male, privileges uh, straight, it privileges white, it privileges, and this is not in order of importance, uh, it privileges uh, la, 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 cisgender, privileges uh, wealth, privileges education, formal education like this. Um, what? Oh, shit. That's right, because it's not a call. Right. Thank you. Right? There's more that we could do, but now the question would be, all right, so if all these other ones are relationships, how are these relationships? What is the male in relationship to? Anybody want to give it a chance? Trick on, what do you think? What's the male in relationship? Very good. That's what they want you to say. <laughs> Because yeah. then, no, 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 that's good. Because then you don't realize that their relationship is actually um, to non males. And that the straight person's relationship is to uh, non straights. And the white person's relationship is to non whites. And the cisgender person's relationship is, you get starting to get the point, cisgenders. What's different about this is that we're husband and wife or the two spouses, right? Husband and husband, husband. Because it, all, all husband means is you have a spouse. And now we know you, your spouse could also be a husband. Your spouse could be a wife. Your spouse could be a, you know, whatever the, the gender fluid term would be. I don't know, right? Just spouse, I guess. But in these things that are culturally significant, right? They take, they don't actually need the other side for their definition. The other side needs it for its definition. So what I'm trying to get at here is, is that there are some things that, that show up and, they, and they'll be cultural expressions, but they're, um, there's still part of something that implies another thing and between the two of them, they, they help you understand, right? So we know a spouse requires another spouse, husband, 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 wife, 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 spouse, spouse, through the gender fluid, I guess, right? We know that a father requires children, <laughs> Unless you're a priest, I guess. A father requires children. A mother requires children, even if they don't survive them. Right? Uh, um, to be a soldier requires other soldiers and commanders and all the rest of these things. To be a teacher requires students. To be a student requires teachers. These are all things that begin to imply each other as soon as you start talking about them. But when you get to these things that are pretty much made up and, and privileged as sort of a means of social control, it literally is the case that, it, that the definition of these confines what else is possible. Everything's, everything else's definition is dependent on that. Okay, Especially when you're talking about uh, the white, one of the issues that's so difficult for people of color and indigenous people to foreground their own experiences is that their experience is always already thrown into contrast as not white. Even though we all know 
there is no such thing as a white person, except sociologically, right? That doesn't mean there are no Europeans. That doesn't mean there are people with pink skin, right? That just means that white is made up. It's totally manufactured. It doesn't have a, and, and, and you can tell it's manufactured because of this beautiful little bit of, of a slide of hand. Uh, 250 years ago, Irish people were not white. Italians were not white. Polish people were not white. Hungarians were not white. I could go on, the list is actually quite long because the only people who were white were Anglo-Germanic. Okay. <clears throat> the word race comes from Portuguese, Rasta. And it literally just means what we now today would call your ethnicity. La raza is your ethnicity, not your, not your skin or genetic code, right? So the Portuguese come up with this notion of la raza. The British or the English pick it up and make use of it. And now they talk about our race of people and the Irish race of people. Who are subordinate and lesser than. This is one of the, fir the first uh, bigotry was the English to the Irish and the Irish as not fully human because they're not English. Uh, then the Portuguese and Spanish and British and French and Dutch began to go to Africa to get slaves because it's a cheap source of, of labor. And now suddenly by the time these slaves arrive in the colonies, either in the Caribbean and South America and somewhere in North America, by the time these slaves arrive there, they've already begun to construct this notion, right, of the black race and the white race. And black in this sense, the N-word among, among English people, the N word would be used, would be thrown at Irishmen, Indians from India, anybody from Africa, anybody of darker complexion. Now, in America, historic, historiologically, this all gets turned into a whole brand new system that had never existed before to such a large degree. Chattel slavery had never existed to the degree that existed here and in Brazil <clears throat> and other places. Uh, you know, Brazil didn't get rid of child slavery until 1893 because the, the German and English and Portuguese landowners made so much money off sugar and coffee that was cheaply harvested by slaves, which is the reason Brazil didn't get rid of slave labor until 1893. But the issue here is, is that once you've got these kinds of levels going on, right? And when I lived in Mexico, I saw these levels of work in a wholly different way, right? Are you complete European ancestry with absolutely no indigenous Mexican blood? Awesome. Are you a mestizo? Are you half Mexican, half European? You know, happy. Are you mostly Indian? Are you a remainder of the Mayans and the and all the rest of those people, are you black? Are you African? That's the hierarchy. So you, you see this thing being constructed in history. And so by the time you get now to now, right? Um, well, now who's white? Europeans. Mostly Europeans. Technically, people with Arab descent should be considered white, but they're different ethnicity. So that's right. So, you know, Iranians are actually from the same stock as Indo Indo Europeans, right? So actually the word Iran comes from the word Aryan. So uh, white people 
now today in the United States are primarily people of European descent. But also Latinx people are white, but they're a different ethnicity. And there's actually, there's actually a reason why Texan, Texas did that. They didn't know what to do with the people of Mexican ancestry here. They couldn't be enslaved, but could they, they, they weren't white, but for purposes of more votes in Congress, they were considered white, which some people saw as the beginning of the end for, for everything, because you're ruining the purity of the race. So you've got all these structures built in, and it's all there historically. You can go back and you can watch it happen. And then that's when you know, well, it started then, <laughs> it started here and got applied this way and then got applied that way. And now here we are in 2021 acting like this is a natural way to organize the world on the complexion of your skin. But you can also see how this makes it difficult for people who do have the dark complexion or who do stand out, right? Because now in the intersectionalities of things, it might, you know, you may be a man, you may be straight, you may be wealthy, right? But your skin color is not right. Your features aren't correct. Something about that, right? But you never know it to listen to a lot of people who are of Irish and Jewish and um, sometimes Cuban descent who, who maintain their whiteness and have become part of the white supremacist structure, right? They protect it and they go along with it. There are black people who protect it and go along with it. It's not because there's a lot of power, in it, right? So one of the things that, that she's challenging uh, for us as an intersectionalist uh, and a womanist is, well, whatever a woman is, it's more than not male. <laughs> and whatever a black person is, it's more than not white. And whatever a uh, cisgender per or a transgender person is, it's more than not cisgender. So these intersections actually become a place where you can begin to talk about how, a per how so many of us actually feel pulled in a lot of different directions because we have all these intersectional commitments. We have all these intersectional pain in us, right? And it's also the case that somebody like me, even though I'm gender queer, I, I don't know whether I'm a man or a woman. I just flow. Most people look at me, they think I'm a man. And I'm still getting my head around, I'm still comprehending myself. I'm still getting my head around all this. So, right? but I'm also quiet. And I'm well educated and I'm employed. So, even though I have a lot of intersections, it's real easy for me if shit gets hard in a way that's difficult for a black gay woman or for. Uh, a trans Latinx man, uh, it's very difficult and it's easy for me to suddenly fall back on being perceived as a man so I have that privilege using my whiteness so that I don't have to be inconvenienced. If I'm not careful, it's easy for me to do that. It's also easy for me, 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 me to center everything <laughs> around me, right? Because I'm used to people listening to me. Why do people listen to me? Because they think I'm a white man. Now y'all are gonna say, wait a minute, what are you, what are you, are you, you literally think the only reason people listen to you is because you're a white man? Let me tell you, I'll tell you, I've run an experiment. <clears throat> I have visited the classrooms over the last decade of nearly every one of my colleagues at the university, of my graduate college. especially wanted to visit them if they were a woman from another country, if they were a person of color, whatever the case might be. 
And I'm not talking about visiting someone who's teaching for the first time. I'm talking about going in and visiting someone who's in their last year of teaching. And they say things that are so far away from the kind of crazy controversial shit that I say and get away with. And they get no respect from the students. They get the students don't listen, they don't, uh, they challenge what they're saying, like they don't know what they're talking about. And I don't experience that. And it's not because I know so much. I know that. I'm not that damn narcissistic. It's a sociological response. A big fat white man just stood up and is fixing to start talking about something we should pay attention to. It's not quite that simple, but it's it's still, you know, and it's and it's like, but it just it just floored me when I began to see it and then began to realize that it happened every class that I went to. For four years, I've watched that happen. And so I, even though that's still anecdotal and it's not like the most rigorous of things, it's a, uh, and maybe it could just be, I was trying to find it and I found it, but <clears throat> I don't think so. Um, and there are other people in, in the philosophy department who, after I had said something, started doing something, and they began to realize that they saw the same thing. The importance of understanding these intersections, right, is kind of trying to figure out slowly but surely what is it that's pulling on them, right? What's pulling on them? I'm not saying that a person, I'm not saying it's bad to be straight. You know, being attracted to someone of the opposite gender performance is not wrong. But straightness is, is a structural order that, that puts a lot of weird performance uh, puts a lot of weird uh, performance requirements on people. Like a good example, I had students one time read, and if y'all want to, we can look at it. I had students one time read a, a little text by an anarchist called uh, Straightness Must Be Destroyed. Automatically, half the class didn't read it because they thought that I was trying to give them an argument for why heterosexuals should be killed or why heterosexuals should be, you know, muted or whatever the case may be. And actually, what the, in the very first paragraph, this is how I knew they didn't read it, because in the very first like paragraph or two, they're like, we're not saying that there's something categorically wrong with being attracted to someone of an opposite gender performance. We're saying that straightness has all of these rules that force everybody into structures that help only a few people and not the people who think that they're getting into the middle of it, right? Like this, you decide that you're madly in love. Two people decide that they're madly in love and they're gonna keep everything traditional. What does that mean? The man has to buy a diamond drink, which already makes the, the, the thing connected to suffering because diamonds don't come from in places of not so. Uh, man has to buy a diamond ring and make a proposal. The woman and her family have to pay for an expensive wedding. Notice how it's all tied to consumption. Uh, and then, you know, there are all of these expectations that come along with it, right? You get married, and then you do this thing, and then maybe you have a kid, and then maybe you save up enough and you buy a house. Notice how all of it extremely connected to a certain kind of how are you spending money because of the structure people haven't always given you, you know that people didn't used to give rings for engagements they give engagement presents but they weren't always rings they certainly weren't always expensive jewels 
So there's a stricture that goes with it, right? You're literally straight jacketed by straight. There are these performances you have. If you, if you can <clears throat> get to a place where uh, the intersections are If you can get to a place where the intersections are are more apparent to you, you can pick apart the threads. So I think that you know one of the things that some people do that. To others will sometimes make them feel like they're being asked to just throw everything in the trash that they believe in, right? Or that they're trying to be converted to some kind of crazy way of thinking about the world. You know, I had a friend of mine recently say, you know, I think you're trying to convert me to being queer. And I'm like, dude, I don't really, you know, give a fuck. I'm just asking if I can go 50 four years and never have actually realized that I just played a part because it was easy to play it. Right? That I think that anybody could do that. Because I think about my life and reflect on crap all the time. And still, after all this time, it was only recently that I suddenly realized, wait a minute, I've just been playing a part. Because it's real easy. So I was told that's the part that I'm supposed to play. So all I was doing was like, you know, I think everyone should really examine and challenge themselves as to asking questions that seem literally like they would be stupid questions to ask. Am I male? Am I straight? Am I white? Am I cisgender? Am I wealthy? That's, that's, that's my these ones here especially because they have to do with the way that we order the world uh, for some kind of conformity <clears throat> so the issue you know and it could be also the case that i'll find out five years down the line you know even though i see myself as more gender queer than than cisgender male uh, I do, you know, I'm just so comfortable in this performance I've been doing for so long. I'll just go ahead and go along. Right. It's not an issue of trying to convince other people that they're wrong in, their, in who they are. It's an issue of trying to get people to see that to be a human being, to be yourself, is very fucking ambiguous. To be human is an ambiguity. It's not a, it's not a clarity, right? To have a self is an ambiguity. That's the reason you have to constantly keep asking yourself, who am I? How do I do this? How, how am I in the world? You know, we ask, this is what philosophy, existential philosophy is always trying to get us to do because if you can understand uh, the ambiguity, <clears throat> And what I mean when I say understand the ambiguity is, uh, by understand the ambiguity is if you recognize you are ambiguous, then most ambitious that's that's exactly what gets you into trouble and be there we go. you recognize that you're ambiguous then um, most of yeah it's the problem about doing these things in front of each other uh, if you recognize that you're ambiguous, then most of your structural 
commitments seem less requisite and more voluntary. So picking apart the threads <clears throat> here allows you to find your, that you're, to accept that you're ambiguous and actually untangle the stuff that makes you look like you're exactly what everybody thinks you are. Right. And in one sense, what this has to do with then is, is that uh, the recognition of your ambiguity and the recognition of the ambiguity coming from all of these different intersections crossing each other um, is that you come to realize that up until the point you do that, your personal history is actually how others define you, not how you define yourself. Oh, I've got to go up. Thank no, no, Ari. You're gonna just do that little symbol, and then I'll I'll try to get. Well, I know that's what that is. Um, but your personal history is how others define you. It's not your. It's not the history of the person. It's how other people have decided this is Eunice. Eunice is X Y Z. And you, by the time you're the age you are now, you've incorporated a lot of that into you. But if you really care about who you are, untangle that your mother, your aunt that you don't like, they define you. They literally put limits around you so that you're easier to understand. But what I wanna say is nobody can be understood. And so rather than being easy, rather than being put in a situation where you're easy, you appear to be easy to understand, you need to comprehend your own life and, 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 and only, engage with people who want to comprehend you, not understand you, who want to embrace you, not, <sighs> okay, I've got you in your hole now, now I don't have to worry about you, I can go deal with something more important. And obviously that's not the way we want to think about our parents, right? But unfortunately, as you know, as a parent, there are times where it's easier to put somebody into the thing that you think that that's what they're doing, put them on autopilot or put them in the thing that they're doing so that you can go and earn money for the family, or you can go and do this, or you can go that you don't have to, you don't have to worry about it because you're very worried about doing this thing. But you don't realize maybe that that's actually because you have incorporated into yourself definitions of who you are and how you are from your parents, from your favorite a uh, captain or sergeant from your, you know, uh, wife and from your children. So this is the interesting thing. All these relationships can lead you to being defined and understood in a way that's not ambiguous at all. And therefore it actually harms your freedom. It's because we're ambiguous that we're free. Does anybody want to take a stab at why I say that? It's because we're ambiguous that we're free. Do you not necessarily strictly combine Yeah. Now I'm not I'm not trying to give you some sort of, you know, Tony Robbins, you know, you can be whatever you want to be kind of thing. I mean, there's a lot of stuff Tony Robbins says that I agree with. But the, you know, but the point I'm trying to get at here is you can be anything within your power, but you don't know what your full power is because you're defined by other people. Right? So someone looks at you or someone looks at you or someone looks at anyone in here or looks at me and they start going through the list. Really quickly, we do it really fast because that's the way it all works, right? Okay, right. white, not male. Apparently, based on the fact that they're wearing Doc Martens, not straight. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, 
<laughs> gotta get one. Gotta get a gay joke in there sometime. I mean, even if I, uh, right? So they start. They go through this stuff. You do it really quickly. Boom, size you up. That and that's just the major reason the business people, you know, they have a business casual and business professional, because the first thing they want to do, it's not just make a good impression. It's not be something that causes a person to stop just on appearance. If you're a business person and you're going to go into an office, you're going to go into doing something, and then someone looks at you and right away, the minute they see you, there's something off, you've already made your job harder. You've already made your life harder. So there's a reason why we do these uniformities, these conformities. So on the one hand, it makes it easier, but on the other hand, the problem is the majority of the time, we're very quickly assessing who we're fixing the interaction with. Making a decision on that. <clears throat> and the way that I dress, I fully take advantage of the fact that most people, when they look at me right away, think that I'm a big fat white man. And nobody says anything about the way. A black female colleague of mine who always dresses to the nines is one of those people whose classes I sit in on where everything she said was challenged and would have been even more challenged if she just showed up wearing the kind of stuff I wear. So there's, you know, there's all this kind of these things. We take these things into consideration. And so we take these, if we take these things into consideration, we begin, that's where you begin asking questions. Why do I have to dress this way? Well, I'm dressing this way because of this kind of thing. But I want to get into a discussion with somebody at work. I want to get into a discussion with somebody at the office about how we have these uniforms and what these uniforms mean. I want to have a real discussion with them, about a real intersection with them, a real interconnection with them, where we talk about the fact that we're more than the clothes we wear, and the job we do. <clears throat> so this personal history then, so what does that mean then? What, what am I, when I say the personal history issue is how other people define you, so where do you go from there? You have to lose your personal history. And sometimes that's something that'll come very easily. Sometimes it's going to come really difficult, right? It's a struggle. It can either be an easy struggle or it can be a hard struggle. But losing your personal history basically is where you do something that you really care about in circumstances that sort of immerse you and make you even more interested, right? And then you don't go and talk about that thing about it. If you do the thing you really love and that you get immersed in playfully, deeply, profoundly, and then you don't share it with everybody, that won't be something they can use to define you. And that in itself becomes a crack. I say to people all the time that I mentor, I don't want to know everything about you. I want to comprehend you. I don't want to understand you. If you start giving me everything, I'll begin to understand an avatar of who you are. And I will, through the influence that I have in mentoring you, begin to overbear. So what I want is for you to find something. You know, this is what I've talked about with y'all. But, you know, in, to the degree you go even farther, right? I'm like, let's talk about stuff you're interested in. Let's have you work on things you're interested in. Let's have you write and read about things you're interested in, right? And we'll do those things together. But what I really want you to do is find something that you're so in love with, so interested in, that it makes you immerse yourself in it so much. It's almost playful, right? Uh, and then don't share that with me. Don't share that with anybody, except maybe other people who you may do it with. And why? So that when you go back to the people that you're around all the time, 
there's something about you they don't understand. And if there's one thing about you they don't understand, how they understand you begins to fall away. Right? For me, when I went away to the monastery for six months in 1983, and then came back home and then went away to Mexico. That was in Puerto Rico. And then went after a month, went back down to Mexico and stayed for another seven months and then came back home. By the time I got home, my parents had no idea who I was anymore. That's hard for a parent, but at the same time, it's the first great step forward for a child, right? You suddenly do that which the parents can't fit. They fitted me going away to the monastery, even though they're Pentecostalists and I was a convert, they fitted me going into the monastery. Everybody on both sides of my family, lots of ministry. So they were okay with that. They were weirded out at first by Catholicism, but then once they understood it, they were like, oh, okay, it's not what we thought it was. Right. They got all that. They made that a part of me. They got it. They figured it out and they figured out how to get that thing into me and make it a part of me. This is Keith Wayne, right? But Keith Wayne went to Puerto Rico and came back Augustine Thomas. And Augustine Thomas went to Mexico and came back August, August, and then very quickly, my parents were like, I don't understand you. Who are you? What are you doing? Why are you listening to this music? Why are you doing these things? Why are you doing that thing? Then I did other things that were so out of the ordinary. They didn't know what that, out of the ordinary in the sense of, that's not ordinary for Keith. That's not Keith Wayne's order of things, right? Um, I did so many, and you know, I, I did a lot of stuff until finally they were like, we just don't understand you anymore. And it wasn't until three years into all of this that I began to actually myself comprehend what was going on because I ran across something that talked about the idea of personal history and losing personal history. And I realized that I'd accidented into it. There's a year of my life, my parents who've known me since birth, <laughs> knew nothing about. And this is the beauty of being a parent who down the line, you'll go through the panic of, I don't know who you are anymore, right? But down the line, 10 years down the line, even though you don't understand them, once your love allows you to comprehend them, you'll be like, I'm very proud of the person you've become. And I'm, I'm proud that maybe I had something to do with that, but I don't take any credit because it's the person you become, right? But they'll never do that if they don't lose their personal history, if they don't have these things that are hidden from the people who've defined their life primarily, right? And this is the sort of thing that Bell Hooks has that, maybe was not always, wasn't there for her mom and dad or wasn't there for some of her siblings. She had this inventiveness and this imagination. She had a world she could escape to through theory that nobody else knew anything about. And that's also another reason why when she asked these weird questions that would kind of throw people off, right? That these, uh, these things are, are coming from the fact she's loosening up her personal history. Does this make sense to you guys? I can't, I can tell you the technique and I will, I'm not gonna like with whole, I can tell you the technique, but the technique is basically just find something you really love and don't not share that with anybody. Or find some circumstance that you ended up in that nobody else knows anything about and use that to help loosen up how other people see you, right? But it, it's active. It has to be active. 
and the choir is going through and asking yourself, what are my relationships? I've said, I've talked about this before. What are my relationships? What are my relations in the sense of not just relationships with people, but my relations to certain situations, certain circumstances, certain places, right? Certain texts. How are those? Why are those making me feel the way they make me feel? Why are those almost predetermining what I'll do before I have a chance to even make a choice. Again, it's not part of a queer agenda or a gay agenda to try to like say, if you're a 13 year old boy who finds himself attracted to another boy for a little while and the world throws down on you and like, that's wrong, that's bad, that's horrible. Really, all they're saying is we don't want you to explore that because if you do, we'll disown you. But is there something really wrong with exploring attraction just to try to understand the attraction? If it's mutual, I'm not saying if it's, you know, <laughs> right? It's not that, and it's just, you know, it's the same thing if, if it was a gay person who finds themselves, a gay man who finds himself attracted to a, to a, a straight woman or, or whatever. It's like sometimes these attractions happen and you don't know what it is because it goes more profoundly than any of these superficial gilded structures that we work under. And so all I'm saying as an existentialist is, and I, and I actually would say this even if I'd become a priest, you're not going to destroy your life by examining how you're attracted to something. You're actually more likely to save your life if you, if you examine it and you think about it and you reflect on it and you talk it out with, the pers- with another person, right? Um, this is a reason why it's so important to um, to do daily reflections and weekly reflections, and just really kind of think about the places where you felt a repulsion. Like, why does that person make me feel repulsed? Why do I find that person repulsive? Why do I find that person attractive? Why do I find that person convincing? Why do I find that person a big blowhard? Why do I, you know? Just ask yourself, because, you know, it's like you get these things sometimes. And it's really more of an intuition than it is a certainty, right? So you have to examine the intuition. How come this person makes me feel so weird? How come this person makes me feel final, even feel whole? So I think that when you're when you're examining uh, these kinds of things, <clears throat> right? Uh, losing your personal history. Oops, I let that close. It. No. When you're, I'm going to concentrate. I'll do it ten times. There we go. So in this losing every person's history, you also question, question how you feel in relation to a situation especially if another is involved. Intersectionality is about the interdependence of every one and the fact that because of its interdependence of all things, very Dallas, because of its interdependence of all things, but also these intersections where different kinds of social pressures can uh, 
accumulate and make you more uneasy or more sick or more unhappy or any of that, you know, any of those kind of things, right? Question how you feel in relation to the situation, especially if another is involved. Praise your comfort, discomfort, or I guess actually a little bit of apathy right, to the source of the intersection. Like in a situation like this today, where we're at. Some of y'all are bored, some of y'all are engaged, some of y'all are uh, distracted, some of y'all are. Da -da 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 -da. I could go on, I could keep saying. You know, that's not, I'm not saying that to be like, y'all should pay attention. I'm saying that to say everybody's in a different spot. So now you question, why do I feel comfortable right now? Why do I feel discomfortable or uncomfortable right now? Why do I not give a fuck actually when I already know? I find that's actually the more likely. Uh, right? Why is this, you know, or in another sense, why is this pleasant? Why is this unpleasant? Or why is this neither pleasant nor unpleasant? It's a kind of simple, nice way to think about a situation, right? And if you see the situation as pleasant, there might be the desire to want to keep doing it. But then the more you do it, the more you begin to realize it's unpleasant. It's just cute. Or it gets to a point where there's no pleasure or I'm displeasure. And it's just, yeah, you just do that rope. <clears throat> and that's really when you talk about feelings, you're not talking about emotion. When you talk about feeling, you're talking about is this comfortable or pleasant? Is this uncomfortable or, or painful? Is this uh, apathetic, apathetic or you know just utterly neutral? I don't care one or the other. That's that's what feelings. Are. I know it seems weird to say that there's a feeling of, of neutrality, but it's still a feeling. Yeah. Emotions are what move us. Feelings are simply an awareness we have of the situation that just sort of makes an evaluation of this is fun. This is really hard. This is not fun. This is just what it is. I gotta do it. But the interesting aspect is, is that if it's unpleasant, often, and you begin to follow the trace back to the intersection, what you begin to discover is that you are quite possibly, uh, you're quite possibly being moved by, uh, excuse me, you're, uh, yeah, you're being moved by uh, commitments that you don't even realize that you have. in a sense of you know, why do people get married? What are the reasons people say why do they get married? Let's set aside for the moment because they love each other. I'm going to hope that's there. <laughs> what are other reasons that people get married? Why get married? More benefits sometimes. Okay, benefits. Legal reasons. Legal reasons and benefits. Yes. Comfort. Comfort. Jim. Not love. I know. I know. I know you love. Love. <laughs> um, it's a, a form of a ceremony, a celebration okay. of, of you know two people coming together, right? Share it with others. Community recognition of, of y'all's pairing, the couple. Okay. But Ron, why do people get married? Uh, sometimes uh, make their family happy. 
Yeah. Now, now you just got <laughs> now everybody uh, heretofore. There's a benefit that can come from it because there's legal arrangements. Dobbs and I are married. We don't believe in marriage, but you know we get better tax breaks. Huh? Is it security? There's a kind of security to it, right? Uh, but is it the issue now becomes is it a security that comes from mutual care, or is it securing a lockdown on the person so that nobody else can have it? That's there. That's a different security. I think you know I've performed like 23 marriages, and I, I've always tried to encourage people to realize that I think it's a and all 23 couples, there's not a single one of them. When I asked, why are you getting married? They didn't say, because we love each other. And I'm like, that's good. Love ebbs and right? It ebbs and flows. It ebbs and comes and goes. It comes up and goes down. It rises and falls. That's what I was trying to say. It rises and falls. Do you like each other? Oh, well, we love each other, obviously. Nope, nope, nope. There's a difference between liking someone and loving someone. And you know it. Because you know that you have a sibling that you love but don't like. You know that you have a cousin that you love but don't like. You know that you have friends that you used to like, but now you love them. But good God, how did they come to believe that that they believe? Right, it happens all the time. So my issue with, with people, and it has to do with this kind of notion of personal history. If you're getting married, there have been two people that I talked to, it's couples I talked out of getting married. Cause they were for freaking the truth. Because their family wanted them to be married. They want to live in the same again. And I'm like, if that's all they care about, you know, I'll sign your document. But really, you shouldn't get married for that reason. And the interesting aspect, of course, is, is that out of the 23 people I married and the two couples I didn't marry, the two couples I didn't marry are still together. The ones that I married, about eight of them have gotten divorces. Anecdotal evidence, but I'm just saying we live in a society in which marriage is supposedly a goal because it's part of the intersection of it's part of the, it's part of the, these things that have power on our, um, these things that have power on our commitments. And that is, they have power on our commitments in the sense You, you're, you're supposed to always do what you can to meet these, these issues. I should also have on here probably not just wealth and education. I should also have on here employable, employable. So when you get to these kind, you're really kind of talking about the sort of things that can be done by the same body. But when you talk about these, they're things that are all based on appearances of superficiality right but every one of them comes with commitments okay. and one of the commitments of straightness and maleness and cisgenderness is you're supposed to get married also oddly enough one of the commitments of maleness straightness and cisgenderness is you're supposed to try to screw as many women as possible even after This is where you have to ask yourself if these are perverting values that are supposed to be the, the guiding light of being human. Love, care, right? justice, courage, generosity, magnanimity, bigness of soul, um, piety, Trying to think of what the virtues are. So I don't even have them in memory. 
Let's check. All right. So we have our values, we have our virtues in our society, but these things can trump that. Right? These things can act to get in the way of that and be like, this is these, these things themselves are values. See? They're not, they're not actually values in the sense of what we normally mean by values. That is, you know, guiding judgments that allow us to kind of like not make too much of a mistake. Uh, but they're, they become values because they're valuable. This is the lottery, baby. You want to talk about hitting the lottery? If you're born male, straight, white, cisgender, wealthy, get an education and you have a job, you get the lottery. Check, 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 check. Right? It's valuable, but they're not values. They actually pervert our values. They get in the way of our ability to do what you might call objective evaluation of our, of our circumstances. And that's not to say if you fall on the other side, non man, non straight, non white, non cisgender, non wealthy, non educated, non employed, that you're not fully human, that you're not, that you're missing out, or that you're just a victim of the structure, victim in the sense of, you know, somebody who whines about the fact that you didn't win by the birth lottery. But <clears throat> they, They do require sacrifices. Pre established privileged evaluations that pervert basic human values require sacrifices. Right? A victim is actually a sacrifice. It, it literally comes, the word comes out of sacred traditions. A victim is something you put up on an altar and you sacrifice. Sacrificio. Make it holy. That's what the word sacrificio means, to make holy. So a victim is made holy by the fact that it's sacrificed on the altar of any of these things in order, right? So it's, and this is the reason why in our society, it's like, oh, women are so nurturing. They're so wonderfully nurturing. Nobody can nurture like a woman. Women, it's just natural. It's a part of what they are, right? And to have that, and to have that they, they literally are sacrificed for this. This is the way they're sacrificed, is to turn them into nurture, to say they're nothing more than reproductive, Bodies for this. <clears throat> Where you often hear gay people are so creative, they're so committed, and to the degree that they get accepted, they still become sacrifices, right? To me, one of the greatest errors in, in what I would call the gay liberation, uh, the great gay liberation um, mistake is that in the 70s, they decided, they were primarily white gay men, decided, we just want y'all to recognize we're just like you. And so therefore, we want the same things you want. Marriage, tax write off healthcare, right? And that turns the whole thing. But what's interesting about that is, is that it automatically means that they allow themselves to be defined by what they want. And this is what has their real substance. This doesn't. And it's just scrambling to do what it can to get the same rights as this one. <clears throat> And we're seeing similar things happening now uh, because there's the history of watching this happen uh, among uh, LGBTQ people. Then trans people and genderqueer people are trying to avoid that. 
but unfortunately it's already split into a half of the group it's like no we're essentially this this is what we are uh it's all about the essentializing of gender in a certain kind of way i am really this and then these others that are like no no no, no. if you start doing that then the privilege to this is the actual thing that matters you know, we're just playing catch up we don't want to do that <clears throat> okay i've radicalized y'all's heads enough Uh, go back here. The idea that she deals with a lot in this text is realizing not only that she doesn't belong in the upper echelons of regular society, she feels like she doesn't belong in her own family. She doesn't recognize these people. She doesn't know, you know, what's So look at this part. Okay. She says, theory is not inherently healing, liberatory, or revolutionary. It fulfills this function only when we ask that it do so and direct our theorizing toward this end. When I was a child, I certainly did not describe the processes of thought and critique I engaged in as theorizing. Yet, as I suggested in Feminist Theory for Margin and Center, the possession of the term does not bring a process or practice into being. Concurrently, one may practice theorizing without ever knowing possessing the term, just as we can live and act in feminist resistance without ever using the word feminism. And one of the things that's really interesting about uh, Bell Hooks and what she has accomplished with her intersectional womanism, intersectional thinking, is, uh, is you know, the recognition that the that privilege of being white manifests throughout the almost the entirety of feminism there's a there is a distinction between white feminists and other women because they can fall back on the privilege of being white And that's okay, it's, it's understandable that it happens. But on the other hand, you know, like one of the things we saw recently in some of the marches, uh, black womenists were trying to give their talk at these, at these uh, anti-abortion or uh, anti-HR 25 or, uh, marches in here and other places. And uh, uh, they get cut off by the, the white women. They'd stop them. They, they'd interrupt them. They'd talk over them. And it's weird because this, this, this thing is, you know, 30 years old, but it's still the same structure. It still keeps happening over and over and over again. Right? But what she's getting at in these things is you can have the words and not be doing what you claim. Right? Like on TikTok, there are a lot of guys that call themselves feminists. But if you start listening to what they're doing, you begin to realize they're playing a role to get women. <laughs> it's, it's kind of disgusting. Right? 
Often individuals who employ certain terms freely, terms like theory or feminism, are not necessarily practitioners whose habits of being and living most embody the action, the practice of theorizing or engaging in feminist struggle. Indeed, the privileged act of naming often affords those in power access to modes of communication. So well, interestingly enough, what she goes into here that's very important is a lot of the stuff that was published by white feminists in the 70s and 80s began uh, among black feminists or black womanists uh, and uh, was picked up by the white feminists and then who did they quote and who did they write in their citations and their references? White men in the academy, not black women activists that they took the ideas from. This happens to this day. I had an issue with a colleague of mine who thankfully was asked to retire because he was kind of repulsive in the long run because he interacted with me on a regular basis and I Socratically engaged with him, which I was always happy to do. But when it came down to it, ideas that, that I helped him flesh out, I didn't get credit for. And he would quote people who published on it. Even though, and this is, I don't want to sound bitter, but even though the MLA, the Chicago Manual of Style, and the American Psychology Association all have ways for a person to cite conversations they've had. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to cite people who were important, not me, even though I'm the one who helped him figure it all out, right? And that kind of thing happens all the time. And it's another part of that structure uh, I was talking about, right? The academy itself is structured in these kinds of ways. So he would always go on about how I should already have a PhD and how I was the Socrates of Denton and all the rest of this shit. But then he would just, you know, basically talk to me for hours and only give me a credit as an acknowledgement in the introduction to the thing. And then he would quote the people who had really good publications that had been quoted by other people back up his arguments and sometimes people that I told him to look at. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is, is that people can use these words and talk about the dignity of academics and you know being a feminist and fighting for the rights of women and fighting for the rights of intellectuals and fighting, you know, they use all that language, but actually all they're doing is protecting the power base, protecting the power situation or trying to find some way, you know, this is how you get priests that are pedophiles. This is how you get teachers that are, uh, that are uh, pedophiles. This is how you get, uh, you know, uh, politicians that are, uh, you know, talking out of both sides of their mouth, making a lot of money off of what they're doing. You get all this because people who have power, in position don't want to just you know share it necessarily and give it away uh and so they protect and uh increase their own social capital and cultural capital by uh appropriating from other people things because you know this what they appropriate is probably not copyrighted or what they appropriate is probably not trademarked or you know, whatever the case may be so we'll go to the last paragraph now and i hope that y'all will read this i'm going to put up another uh carefully i'm going to put up another uh one of her things and some paulo frere for next saturday and then the sunday after there'll be a long quiz for people who want to take the quiz or you can offer to do some other kind of thing to make a to make a grade okay the quiz will be open book open test it'll be online i mean you don't you know ever Anything I give you is always going to be open book. Uh, Let's do it that way. Let's go this way.
Okay, so this is a quote from someone else from um, Patricia Williams. You know, do you feel like reading? Mm -hmm. There are moments from there. There are moments in my life when I feel as though a part of me is missing. There are days when I feel so invisible that I can't remember what day of the week it is. When I feel so manipulated that I can't remember my name. When I feel so lost and angry that I can't speak a civil word to people who love me best. There are times when I catch sight of my reflection in store windows and I'm surprised to see a whole person looking back. I have to close my eyes at such times to remember myself, draw an internal pattern that is smooth and whole. Great. It's not easy to name our pain to theorize from that location. There's nobody in this room. We all are at intersections. There's nobody in this room who shouldn't respond to that paragraph. Right? You all at some point feel empty or broken or not whole incomplete, misunderstood, oppressed, okay? And, and an interesting aspect of, you know, just on the side of, of being a white person saying all of this kind of stuff, an interesting aspect of being a white person saying all this stuff is to recognize that as a white person, uh, it's not that I don't have oppressions, it's that I am, I am in a position where the whiteness can make me feel like I'm not supposed to recognize I'm oppressed. So when people talk, when this is a common kind of like issue that happens, people talk about white privilege to a person who, you know, works 50 hours a week and can barely keep the roof over their head and feed their kids. And they're like, I don't see what my privilege is. And the issue really there is simply to say it's because you don't actually, it's because you never really have to think about your race. That's the privilege. That's why that's all white privilege is. My privilege is you never have to think about your race. But now guess what? You're a working person. You always have to think about employment. Right? You want to advance, probably have to think about education. You want to, you want to, uh, you know, have a have a good relationship with your kids. Then you're going to end up in these other kinds of problems. You want to have a good relationship with your spouse. You're going to end up in these other kinds of problems. There is, it is not easy being human. Everybody suffers, and it's not a competition. So when a black person talks about the problems of being black to a white person. It might sound at first like what they're saying is you don't have the problems I have. And that black person might actually be wealthier than you. But the issue is not you don't have, a, they're not saying you don't have the problems I have. They're saying I have this problem that you don't have to worry about. And then we both have these other problems. Working, making our spouse happy, keeping a roof over our head making sure that we pay our tax. Now, we've all got these issues. I just have this one thing here you don't normally have to think about. And because you don't have to think about it a lot of times, you don't see what the big deal is for the people who do have to think about it all the time, right? Or maybe you're European ethnicity, so you don't have to think about having an Arab or an Iranian or a Mexican or Latinx ethnicity. Ethnicity is not an issue for you. Maybe you're a proud Scottish person. Right. OK, great. That's nice. But people who look different or have extremely different ethnicities, that's something they think about. So you should always think about what privilege in this sense is not. Look at me. I get extra shit. It's I don't have to worry about this thing that other people are constantly reminded about. Right. <clears throat> so that's why I say, you know. This is so moving when you really stop and you look at what she's saying, right? It's not easy to name our pain, to make it the location for theorizing. And Patricia William writes that even those of us who are aware are made to feel the pain that all forms of domination, homophobia, class exploitation, racism, sexism, imperialism, and gender. Everybody's dominating.
And now the question becomes, and why we're going to read a little more hooks and definitely read more into Paul Freire, is to try to figure out how, as we attempt to not be dominating, we don't simply turn into dominators. As we attempt to not suffer dehumanization or to dehumanize, that we don't turn into dehumanizers. That's, that's what we're going to do the rest of the semester explore ourselves and try to establish structural opportunities in ourselves that will help us to see, not stop us from doing it at all, because you're going to slip into it from time to time, but help us see as quickly as possible. When we slipped into being dominating, manipulative, dehumanizing, whatever the case may be. And maybe we're using some aspect of our suffering to justify it. Right. So Bell Hooks is an African-American woman intellectual, highly influenced by the Brazilian thinker Paulo Freire and his pedagogy of the oppressed. And it's all about systems. Oppression is built into us. Right. It's very exciting. It's built How do I get it out? Sorry. Uh, yeah. It's, it's built into us. But we can get it out of us because it's not actually a part of being human. But if we won't get it out of us, if we default to, well, you made me suffer, so fuck you, I'm going to make you suffer. And that's Frere's point. It doesn't do any good to elevate yourself if you just turn into another dehumanizer at a higher level. Right. Okay. Great. I love you. I hope all of you have a beautiful week. I'll put up the other bell hooks and uh, the other in the, in the first chapter of Frary. The quiz will be up so that you can take a look at it. I'll actually probably create something so you can see what the quiz is and what it's about so you can like know what you're reading for. And that way, when you take the quiz, you'll see that's real easy. And doing stuff a little different than I did before. But if it's also the case that you're like, I don't really want to do this, I'd rather do, you know, think about how this stuff applies to the things that I'm doing right now, we can come up with some stuff for to take the place. Okay. That's up to you. I don't put a little responsibility on you, but I want you all to use the class to build things better for yourself. Okay. All right. I love you all. Have a beautiful weekend. Or, and beautiful weekend. And I'll see you.